Imagine waking up from a coma, forgetting everyone you've ever known, your mom, your dad, even your own name, but remembering the name of your identical twin. What if that twin fabricates your entire childhood for the purpose of protecting you from a hideous truth about a parent? Would the lie be warranted? And would you want the truth regardless of how ugly that truth is? This video has spoilers, so if you haven't watched the film, Tell Me Who I Am, please go to Netflix and do so. It's so well done, you won't regret it. The film delves into trauma, memory, and the complexities of family dynamics, but ultimately it is a love story between these two brothers who heroically step up for each other in ways that you can't even fathom. We're gonna talk about family trauma, coping mechanisms, and healing modalities. I promise you, you're not gonna wanna miss a minute of this, so let's get right into it. The documentary chronicles Alex Lewis, who loses his memory after a traumatic motorbike accident and relies 100% on his twin brother, Marcus, to reconstruct their shared past. Marcus decides to paint their past with rose-colored glasses to shield Alex from knowing that they were sexually abused by the hands of their mother. Not until the passing of both both parents at age 32, did Alex begin to question the narrative he was given to by Marcus. Your mother died. And then five years later, yeah, she, she dies. She had a brain tumor and she died quite quickly. And that was when everything changed because I cried because I had grown to, this, to, to love this lady and nobody else did. And that was strange. My brother had a completely opposite reaction to me. I didn't expect that. And that got me thinking that something was wrong. This film came out in 2019, so I'm late to watching this. But then again, it hasn't even been a year since I admitted to myself that my 76-year-old mentor, who my father introduced me to at 14 years old, is really a pedophile who groomed and raped me for a quarter of my life. I'm currently producing a documentary about it right now, which I will keep you all posted about. When I came out as a child sexual abuse survivor, I never would have expected that my father, who I saw as my best friend, the person I thought I would be able to count on the most, to be the only one in my life who chooses not to believe me. There are times my anger towards my father is greater than the anger towards my abuser. I often hear other victims say that they can have more anger towards their parents than the perpetrators themselves because they feel that the onus was on them to protect their child. But here, the abuser and the parent is one in the same. Their cards were truly stacked against them, but their one major blessing was having each other. My abuser exposed me to a lot of child porn to normalize pedophilia for me, and a lot of footage he showed me were of fathers raping their children. Children as young as two, three years old, and my abuser would say, look, they enjoy it. It's natural. There's nothing wrong with this. To many, this is so unbelievable, but the stats show just how prevalent this problem is. The United States is the number one consumer year after year of child rape material, and oftentimes close to number one in production. Abetted by the internet, which expanded the avenue that criminals can pursue their darkest desires, with little risk of getting caught, have today forced over six million children into sex slavery, labor, and organ harvesting. For the last two, three years, we've had over 130,000 unaccompanied minors, many under the age of five years old, let into the country without their sponsor vetted or their DNA or background checked. So the border crisis raises serious concerns for these vulnerable children. The underbelly of our digital age is an economy of pedophilia. If you wanna learn about how it ties to the porn industry, check out my interview with Arden Young Young, an investigative journalist and former child actor who exposed Pornhub and the problem of underage content. When you wake from that coma, I just, you have nothing. I have nothing at all. I just see my twin brother opposite me. I immediately say his name. Um, so I think I'm okay. And then I see my mother then comes up to the bed and I have no idea who she is. And then Marcus says to me, do you actually know your own name? And I say, no, I don't. So that's how it started. From learning how to tie his shoelaces to brushing his teeth, he always looked to his brother. 
but in a month's time, he progressed to the mindset of a 14-year-old, started asking questions about what their childhood was like, and would compare it with the cookie-cutter images he saw on TV. He started asking questions like, what were vacations like? Was mom a good mother to us? And Marcus, unwilling to subject his brother to the pain of their past, fabricated a reality that negated the abuse. It further produced the pleasant byproduct of gaslighting himself into thinking that he was free from his trauma. We all start off like Alex when we come into the world as infants, crying, hungry, not knowing what hunger even is. And then some magical person that you later refer to as mom pumps you with this thing called milk, and that pain in your stomach magically goes away. Parents can carry the seat of pseudo-gods in their minds. There's a mystical component of parents being able to grapple with the unknown, and as we all grow older, develop higher competencies. Most, if not all people, grasp onto this image we have of them as young, vulnerable babies. The level of vulnerability in our species, set to the vastness of the unknown, could be why the bond between between parent and child feels sacred. But what if your mother is like Marcus and Alex's, a Ghislaine Maxwell-like figure who not only sexually violated them, but were individually pimped out to her rich and powerful friends? You know the term, blood is thicker than water? The idea that you have your family's back no matter what? Well, do you know what the full quote is? The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. That line really means the opposite of what we think it means. When the Bible says to honor thy mother and father, I take it to mean that you must honor your true father and mother in heaven. For anyone to properly mature, you must fully demystify the authority figure. When you have a parent that serves as a role model and you're trying to psychologically develop, the likelihood that your parents are psychologically complete is slim to none. And I don't say that as a knock to parents, but a truth of the human condition. And even if you do have the very best parents on the planet, how can you be fair to them if you keep them mystified? Propping them up on this pedestal will never allow you to fully acknowledge how difficult it was to raise you. Breaking free from your earthly parents, regardless of how good or bad they were at their job, is your path to becoming your own person. Have you noticed that we often see stories structured with the main character having two sets of parents? For instance, in Harry Potter, the muggle parents who don't have their act together set in opposition position to a magical set of parents. In a religious context, we have our earthly parents and then our true father up in heaven. The realization that you are magical, that you are more than merely a child of your parents, is all part of the treacherous journey of self-actualization. The divine hero always has two sets of parents, and you cannot construe yourself properly without that understanding. Letting go of my father left a huge hole, but it allowed me to fully understand the superficiality of our relationship and move into adulthood. Without doing so, I never would have been able to come out with my secret. I would never have been ready to get married to the love of my life. I would forever be on tiptoes, worried that my father would once again leave me. There are people that say the truth is the truth and you should have told him and he would have had to go to therapy and he'd have to deal with all of those things for the rest of his life. And it wasn't up to you to play God and it wasn't up to you to, to, to take away those things. But for me, the way I feel, I have it. And it's a shit feeling. He doesn't have that feeling. He doesn't know what it feels like to feel like that. I gave him a present of not knowing any of that. And so for me, that has to be a gift. It has to be something precious. Even at 52 years old, those haunting memories can take you right back to feeling like a child again. So much of the so-called trust that I had with my abuser and my father was contingent on holding their lies. And I felt justified in doing so because the fear of my father abandoning me like he did when I was two years old was too much for my younger self to bear. Similarly, Marcus lied to protect his brother, the both of them, from a nasty truth. I'm, I'm 18 years old, but I probably got a mental age of six, seven, eight year old. So I'm quite low. So I'm not asking many questions and everything's very basic to start with. It was a gradual thing. So obviously as his mental age grew over the couple of weeks, um, I would then, he would be asking me slightly more difficult questions once we got past the basic stuff. I had to make a conscious decision once I'd gone in too far to actually change the narrative. 
which I decided that I wanted to do. So Marcus, seeing Alex revert to the mind of a child, in a true act of love on Marcus's part to shield Alex like any parent would shield their child, paints a beautiful lie for him. But as the lie gets more obvious, as the nature of a lie always does, the withholding of the truth by Marcus became a weight, progressively heavier and heavier for either one of them to bear. That my own twin had actually lied to me. The one person that I absolutely trusted 100% has now betrayed me. I was angry with him, really angry with him for the first time ever. I was angry with him that we knew everything about each other and we had no secrets. We do everything together. Yet, behind all of that, he still had a secret. I had a phone call with my abuser telling him I could no longer bear the secret from a person that I intend to spend the rest of my life with. He took the call as a threat. He said that if I came out with the secret, I would be destroying his life, my life, and my family's life. And so I remained silent. I suffocated myself to protect my abuser and my father, who I loved dearly, but at the expense of me. And the lie can be comfortable, right? It's crazy. I used to think that the greatest gift that my father gave me was introducing me to my abuser because I wanted a father. More than anything, I wanted a father. And my corrupted child mind believed that I finally found the father figure that I always wanted in a pedophile. And I lost my memory voluntarily. And it was great. And I was free. And I could be rid of all the things that she'd done to me. And all this hurt that she caused me. And all the shame. You feel ashamed. You feel dirty. You feel used. I think as a child sexual abuse victim, there's a tendency to blame yourself, either consciously or pseudo-consciously, because the very act of holding the secret actually prevents you from seeing the truth reflected through another human being, which is a mechanism to which one can become conscious of what's going on. Thus why many abusers isolate their victims. From the age of, I think, 14, we lived out in the shed, in the garden. Mum still didn't want us to have a key. Epstein had his island. I was in a garage, away from my dad and my stepmom. My abuser's wife would be in the room next to us while I was getting raped. But nothing was acknowledged, nothing was said. The ways in which we delude ourselves into thinking everything will be okay if we just sweep it under the rug. Ignoring it because that's the civil, more polite way to handle the situation, right? If you're still watching this, I have a message for you. Stop hiding. Tell the truth, be fearless. Doing so will lead you on the adventure of your life. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Until next time, thanks for watching Inverted World.